Bible to Luke chapter 16. And uh, we'll be prepared to look at God's Word. <clears throat> and uh, as I prepare this, this is uh, not going to be an exhaustive study, but uh, rather I'd like to bring out some uh, <clears throat> devotional uh, principles and thoughts to encourage us um, to uh, reevaluate our lives, but also uh, to uh, consider where our confidence is and where our hope is this evening. And uh, we're looking at the rich man and Lazarus. And before we do that, let's uh, ask the Lord to help us. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that you might uh, just strengthen us and help us this evening to uh, speak and to hear the Word of God. And Father, that you might uh, uh, fill our hearts with uh, thy love, uh, that you might strengthen us with thy strength, that your Spirit might encourage us, and Father, that we might do the things which please thee, and that we might have confidence in thy Word alone. Father, if there's uh, any here this evening without Christ, Father, I pray that uh, uh, they might consider the end of this rich man, uh, Father, and that they might see their great need of of hearing the word of God, and uh, Father, uh, not going to that place of torment. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> as uh, thinking in introduction, as we consider the rich man and Lazarus, uh, what lessons are there for us? Uh, one of the first things I see as we would look at the rich man and Lazarus is this is a contrast. Uh, the rich man is very rich, and Lazarus is very poor. Great contrast in their lives, <clears throat> a great contrast in their circumstances, uh, great contrast in their death. Now, they do have death in common, but what it says of their death, there's a great difference. And then we see a great contrast in where they go, where it says that uh, <clears throat> uh, Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom, and he was comforted there, where <clears throat> uh, this, uh, this rich man, it says, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And it says that he was tormented there. So there's a great contrast. And in this great contrast, we also see a great gulf. That is, <clears throat> um, there's a great gulf that uh, um, it says that he being in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. And then Abraham, when he answered, he says, he says there's this great gulf fixed between us. Uh, also, I'm considering uh, how great of a gulf there is between us and the living. Now, there is a great gulf between the dead and the living. Uh, but also, we think of that great gulf between God and man. Uh, you know, who could stand in God's presence? And uh, we didn't sing that song, but that hymn would say, Oh, what a mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. <clears throat> And so there's a great there's great contrast here between the rich man and Lazarus. <clears throat> we also have the Lord as he teaches about money, riches. It really goes along with the book of Job and their thoughts there and the blessings of God. Uh, when you look at the beginning of chapter 16, he said unto his disciples, verse 1, there was a certain rich man. Uh, the Lord spoke a lot about riches. He we see the uh, parable of there's that certain rich man whose uh, crop bare fruit and he tore down his barns and he built bigger barns. And uh, we also uh, consider the rich young ruler which came to the Lord Jesus. And he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> uh, we think of Lazarus, I mean Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a rich man, it says. Uh, uh, there was other uh, rich men. And so the Lord taught about riches and the Lord would always warn us against trusting in riches. Not that riches were sinful, but see, there's a great many warnings, and I think this is a theme throughout the Bible, despite what Job and his friends thought, but also, especially in the New Testament, uh, as God teaches us about money, and what our attitude is about money, and what we have, and, and as we think of, of money, we also think of the abundance of other riches we have. We think of riches of health, uh, just a, our friends, uh, how rich it is just to be here in this church and to be in Canada and to have our families and to have our homes, how greatly God has blessed us. <clears throat> and then, as I also think, as we go to look at this uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, I think of the Lord's, uh, the end 
as A Abraham would answer this rich man, um, the sufficiency of the word of God. He says, uh, send somebody back to my brethren. Bridge that gulf between the dead and the living. And that has happened. Our Lord rose from the dead, but also we think in the past there's others that had been risen from the dead. And he said, if somebody came from the dead, and Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. And he argued with uh, Abraham, and he said, no, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even though somebody rose from the dead. And so we want to also look at the sufficiency of the word of God. And <clears throat> we want to do this quickly. So first I want to look at the lives of the rich man and the lives of the life of the rich man and the life of Lazarus. Verses 19 to 21 give, them their, give us their circumstances. And then also I want to look at their character. And you say, well, it doesn't say a whole lot about their character. Uh, no, but what is there, uh, what is inferred, what we can see by re reading it, uh, it tells us some pretty significant facts about their character. But first, let's look at their circumstances. This rich man mentioned first, the Lord says there was a certain rich man. <clears throat> the Lord does not name him, but he says this rich man was clothed in purple. This would be the color that those who were uh, ruling would wear. Uh, also, it would be the color that only those who had money could afford. Uh, uh, he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So he had an abundance that fared sumptuously. He had a feast. Every day was Thanksgiving. Uh, every day was Christmas dinner. Uh, maybe every breakfast, lunch, and supper. Uh, and uh, how well off this rich man was. His circumstances were quite good. <clears throat> and we are told here he had a table. And we think, well, if he's going to fare sumptuously, he would have a table because Lazarus desired the crumbs that fell from that table. Uh, but also, uh, I just wonder what kind of house he had because Lazarus sat at his gate. He had, you know, you think of the, the fine house and they have two acres and there's a fence around it and there's a gate and there's a, you know, uh, you know, and then some people who, 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 you know, maybe to put on, they don't have the fence, but they have the gate. Gives a, you know, they have their driveway and they've got a brass line on either side or a steel gate. And uh, you say, well, that's for show. And sometimes I've seen houses that have not been grand, but the entrance looked pretty good. And uh, putting on a show. But this rich man had great circumstances. And so the Lord gives us as a count. And as I look at this, <clears throat> I think of what kind of circumstances are we in? You say, well, this rich man was an ungodly man. But <clears throat> what about us? Uh, how rich are we this evening? And uh, really, as I think of, you know, faring sumptuously, uh, I can raise my hand to that. Um, uh, I, I have uh, nothing to complain of in the food department. And as Pastor Tim says, another day in Canada when we don't starve, and he kind of has a bit of sarcasm to his voice as we get together for Thanksgiving. But we have an abundance in Canada. And I don't think anybody here can raise their hand and say, I, I haven't been fed very well. You know, we had beans for, for beans and nothing but beans for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Or we eat lentils. Or we get porridge twice a day. That's it. And water. And anybody here on that type of diet, besides trying to get healthy, I suppose. Uh, you know, and that's, uh, you know, uh, we suffer in North America for our, our we, we fare sumptuously, and I think most of us, my sister visited uh, my mom today, and she was talking about all the clothes that her daughter left in her house, and all the clothes she has. And you say, well, I, we get a lot of shop, we get a lot of clothes given to us. We get a lot of clothes at Value Village. That's true, but I have an abundance of clothes in my closet that I don't wear. Uh, I have too many. And uh, maybe they're not all purple and fine linen, uh, but we have, we are, can uh, have a lot in common with this rich man. <clears throat> and uh, so this rich man, and then in verse 25, as we consider his circumstances, Abraham said, in your lifetime, you received good things. And I can think, uh, how good has God been to you so far? How many good things have you received? And you can think of, you, we can think of food and clothing, but we can think of much more than that, can't we? Uh, family, loved ones, blessings, possessions, uh, how good health, uh, 
how, how good God has been to us, and we should be very thankful. So this is the circumstances of this rich man, and then we see what a contrast Lazarus makes. Now, it's interesting, the rich man is not named. Uh, the name Lazarus is the Greek name, uh, Eli, word for Eliezer. And Eliezer means he whom God helps. And then I, I think of Abraham's servant, Eliezer, uh, he whom God aids. Um, there's a slight difference, and I'm not sure what it is, but uh, uh, think of uh, Lazarus is given a name when you think of, well, why didn't the Lord name the rich man? <clears throat> and I, I just as we add this here, well, first of all, the Lord would not give him the honor of a name. But Lazarus has a name. Why? Because God loves Lazarus. He says, that's Lazarus. Uh, <clears throat> so we think of Lazarus is named uh, particularly, and the name means he whom God would help, or he whom God would aid. <clears throat> and uh, Lazarus' name is remembered. We know who Lazarus is, don't we? We know Lazarus. The rich man, who is he? He's forgotten. Well, oh, there's a rich man, but he's forgotten. He's gone. His name is not remembered anymore. God knows our names. It says uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he knoweth his sheep, and he calleth us by name. When the Lord calls us by name, he says, John. That's by name. It's personal. <clears throat> and uh, I think there's a new name written down in heaven. He's given us that new name. Now Lazarus was a beggar. And his circumstances, you know, there wasn't the welfare. It says here that he had to be laid at his gate. Otherwise, I think uh, he could not walk properly. Uh, they carried him and laid him at uh, the rich man's gate. Now why would he be at the rich man's gate? Well, that's going to be a good place to beg, you would expect, right? You're not going to go beg at, at the poor end of town. You're going to go beg where the rich people walk by. And perhaps shame them into putting something in. Or perhaps they have, they have the means to help you. And so he's sitting at uh, Lazarus. He's sitting at the rich man's gate. <clears throat> and notice his health. He says he was full of sores. He was full of sores. Now I thought of Job again. <laughs> now, only Job's sores. You know, how long was Job afflicted? Was it a, a months? Was it a year? I don't know. But compared to probably Lazarus, it was a short period of time. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we're told, we, we see notes, uh, evidence in the scriptures here that Lazarus got any relief from his sores. Otherwise, he didn't recover his health. He didn't recover his wealth. He never had it in the first place. <clears throat> um, he died in poverty. He died in these mean circumstances. And notice as he He's giving that. He's telling this to the Pharisees. And it tells us that the Pharisees were covetous. They liked money. Many of them were rich. Many of them prospered. Many of them had the fine uh, linen. Many of them had the purple. Many of them had uh, fared sumptuously. And so <clears throat> the Lord says, here's this poor beggar, Lazarus, covered in sores. And so, so for the Jewish thinking, uh, this man must not be very loved of God to be in these circumstances. And again, a lot of parallel with the book of Job there, uh, but see, they would be wrong. <clears throat> uh, we are to beware of covetousness, and uh, <clears throat> riches is not a proof of God's love to them that have it, or that they love God. Nor is poverty a proof that God doesn't love us. And we're, so we're told to be, beware of covetousness, but we're also told not to trust in uncertain riches. So uh, we're not to put our trust in riches, but here we have this rich man in Lazarus. Now, <clears throat> we see the relief for, the, for Lazarus is he got to eat the crumbs that fell from the table. Now, is there anybody here? John, where did he go? There he is. Sometimes something falls on the floor and I pick it up, and, you know, 10 seconds. Still good, but uh, no, we don't eat. We don't eat the scraps that fall off the table. But the rich man, uh, the, it says that Lazarus, it says he was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Um, I think of the uh, people of faith, and we'll look at this this later. But the, 
Who was that? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to think of what that woman said. When the Lord said to her, it's not fit to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And what did she say? I'm trying to think of her answer. Anybody remember her answer to the Lord? It was a good one. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. Is that what she said? I might be a little off of it. Yeah, but the idea is there. You understand the idea. She's saying, Lord, I'm not asking you to treat me like a favorite son. Just give me some crumbs. And uh, the Lord gave her a lot more than crumbs, didn't he? And the Lord was gracious to her. Uh, so what we're told here, here's how Lazarus got fed. Uh, he said, well, you know, if I could just get some of the chunks, the broken pieces of crust that fall on the floor, some of the scraps uh, that are left on the floor, that's what I would eat. And uh, he had a good health care program. The dogs came and licked his wounds. Now, I, I thought to myself, in this, this sense, uh, he might be doing a little better than Job, at least. Uh, you know, at least Job's was temporary, but Job didn't have the dogs licking. You know, Job had a scratch. He had to take that broken piece of pottery and scrape his arms. And so Job was in great misery, but I, I would expect Lazarus had great misery, but I think he got some relief from these dogs licking his wounds. And uh, you say, well, that doesn't sound too relief, but uh, perhaps if you were in such circumstances, uh, you would welcome the company of these dogs. So these dogs came and licked his wounds. And I think there perhaps would even be some healing value to that. And I won't go into that uh, right now, but uh, it would help keep the wounds lean, uh, clean. Sorry. And so we see great different circumstances, but what about their character? Uh, what does it say about their character here? And you say, well, it doesn't say anything about their character. Well, <clears throat> I think this rich man knew very well who Lazarus was, because when he got to, uh, to Hades, he said he saw Lazarus, and he knew who Lazarus was. He says, Abraham, send Lazarus to me. And then later he says, send Lazarus to my brethren. <clears throat> and I think he knew, first of all, not only that Lazarus was in a position to help, he was in Abraham's bosom, but Lazarus was a good man. <clears throat> and yet, this man who fared sumptuously, whose dogs were fed every day, couldn't be bothered to send Lazarus to the back of the servant's <coughs> room and give him a decent meal. Uh, you see, we're not told here that this rich man was a crook. There's nothing wrong with being rich. Nobody goes to hell because they're rich. <coughs> but we hear, we see a, 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 a what should I say, a, a, a glimpse of his character. And his character reveals who he is by nature. Uh, he's not a redeemed one. Uh, he is indifferent to Lazarus' suffering. He passes Lazarus at his gate. He sees his dog limping Lazarus' wounds. He sees Lazarus seeking to eat the crumbs of food that fall on the floor. You know, perhaps after the great dining hall is done, the sloppy guest, uh, you know, there's food on the floor. Sure, Lazarus, if you want to eat it, go ahead. Maybe he even thought he was doing some good, I don't know, but I think... Uh, this is a cruel man. You say, well, he hasn't hurt Lazarus. Yes, he has. Uh, <clears throat> uh, see, we are our brother's keeper, aren't we? And uh, I think of uh, basic, you know, basic Christianity. Should we not show kindness to someone in need? Isn't that what Job said? You know, for a man, pity should be shown from his friend. <coughs> well, maybe Lazarus was not the rich man's friend. Nobody was his neighbor. And he did nothing. He had the means to do good. I think as, uh, James tells us that if we see our brother, our sister lacking food or raiment or clothing, <clears throat> that uh, that we should we should take care of that need. If we have something, if we have the ability to feed them or clothe them or house them or help out, then that is our duty to do it. And so, <clears throat> uh, but. This rich man did nothing about Lazarus' needs. As far as we can see, Lazarus died eating uh, crumbs off the floor, begging in the gate, and having dogs lick his wounds. <clears throat> we are our brother's keeper. Now let's look at one verse here, Proverbs 3, 27. We'll look at one, one verse, Proverbs 3, verse 27.
We're told here in the book of Proverbs, it says, With not, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in thy power of thy hand to do it. And then he says, Say not to thy neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give. And see, it was in the rich man's power to help Lazarus. Lazarus had a need, and the rich man did nothing. Oh, he didn't drive him from the property. He says, if you want to hang out with the dogs, you know, we'll let Lazarus do that. He, he couldn't even, I'm sure his servants fed better. Isn't that the prodigal son? The prodigal son knew the servants uh, were fed better. And yet this man uh, was indifferent to the need of Lazarus. And uh, I think of our Lord giving the parable of who is my neighbor? You see, this rich man would be right up there with the scribe and the Pharisee who passed on the other side of the street. And uh, uh, we need to be careful that this isn't our attitude. And so we see a bit of his character here is that he had no care for his fellow man. And I thought perhaps he had no care for his brothers. See, when he got to Hades, then he says, oh, my brothers. But when he was living, who cares about Lazarus? Maybe he didn't care too much about his brothers, too. I would expect he was a selfish man who trusted in his riches and thought everything was going his way. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we have a glimpse of this character, and the glimpse that we have of his character is not good. Uh, and uh, we need to be careful uh, that as believers, not only do we have riches, that is, I have material blessings, but also I think of the, I have the riches of Christ. Uh, and if anybody here hasn't read Tim Reiner's uh, <coughs> article back there that shows a picture of the beggar woman on there, Read it. <laughs> it's a good, it's a very good. And, and Brother Reiner says, he says, my cup, which is so full, he says, how slow I am to share. And uh, I ask you tonight, how full is your cup? And who around you uh, needs that cup? Who, who, who needs some of the blessing that God's blessed you with? And so think of how we can help uh, other people. Uh, and that is our, our duty and our ministry. <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at the, the uh, character of Lazarus. Now, what do we know about Lazarus' character? Well, number one, it says that he uh, was laid in the rich man's gate and desired to be fed with the crumbs. Otherwise, he wasn't complaining. He wasn't quarreling. He wasn't demanding. He was begging. And I see here that he was, uh, Matthew Henry said uh, that this, this man that was not only poor, but he was poor in spirit, in the best sort of the meaning of the word. Uh, like Job, and like we're exhorted to do, he patiently endured. He endured with a meek and patient spirit. <clears throat> That's what I see in the character of Lazarus. That he was not a, 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 a pushy man, but he was one who patiently endured. And, uh, and so we see an ideal... A, a, a glimpse of his character here. Um, we'll look at a little bit more of that when we get to the, the next part. Let's take a look at their death. How different they were in their death. Now death is a great equalizer. The rich and the poor both die alike. The saint and the sinner. If you would go to the, the casket, you would say there's no difference. And yet it says some significant things here about Lazarus' death. And it's only in verse uh, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, 22 where their deaths are mentioned. It says, It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. <clears throat> uh, so both die. And it says here, uh, Lazarus died first. And so not always, you know, Billy Joel had it wrong, only the good die young. And uh, in this case, we say sometimes the good die young. But I also think, well, why would Lazarus die? Well, <clears throat> maybe he had some real critical health needs, right? Uh, I think uh, being covered in wounds, uh, laying out in the open begging, and eating food off floor is not a, a recipe for a long and healthy life. Uh, not really. But I also thought of the favor of God. God says, I'm going to relieve Lazarus and bring him home. And uh, you see, Job says, well, there's relief in death. 
But see, Lazarus got more than the relief of dying. He was taken into Abraham's presence, uh, the Abraham's bosom. <clears throat> As we look at this, it says that the angels carried him. Isn't, I thought that that's pretty good. He was carried by the angels. Uh, see, precious in the sight of the Lord is what? The death of his saints. And he says, it's not enough for me to wait for them to come. I'm going to send my angels to carry Lazarus. And you say, well, could anybody have a grander entrance into eternity than to be carried by angels into God's presence? And I say, <clears throat> the Old Testament, uh, the, the souls of the, the saints, they went to Abraham's bosom. The Lord called it when he was on the cross. He said to that thief, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. That's Abraham's bosom. A uh, pastor did a good study on it, and I'm not going to do that study tonight. Uh, uh, today, if we die, we go into God's presence, into the presence of the Lord. Uh, but but uh, it says here that angels carried Lazarus into, uh, into uh, Abraham's bosom. And uh, quite a thing. And I think of that verse when the Lord was rebuking me. He says, you're going to see, you're going to see uh, the, the, you know, others. You're going to see the Gentiles sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and you yourselves left out. You see, the Lord is really preaching here against the Pharisees, who are the rich, who love riches, <clears throat> and who would not lift a finger to help others. And he's giving them here this story about Lazarus and this rich man. <clears throat> and he's rebuking them, but he's also warning them, and he's also <coughs> giving them a, a great lesson here. <clears throat> and so... Uh, Lazarus is carried into Abraham's bosom by angels. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, what kind of a grand entrance are we going to have into God's presence? You think, well, well that well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, <clears throat> I think of where Peter says, uh, we're going to have a grand entrance. Well, I think every saint's going to have a grand entrance. Every saint's going to have a grand entrance into God's presence. No saint is going to come into God's presence and not hear, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome home. Uh, see, we say, well, what about, you know, saved by the skin of their teeth, uh, won't be ashamed. Well, see, that's on this side. That's looking at it. But when we get there, there are no second-class citizens in, uh, in God's presence. There's none that God is ashamed of. They're all, it says God is not ashamed to call them his own. He owns them as his own. And I think maybe the, the best is we think of how precious it is for us as Christians uh, that as we die as a saint of God. <clears throat> I thought of uh, Acts chapter 7 and I thought of Stephen. And where it says uh, Stephen was being stoned to death. And Stephen said in verse uh, uh, 56, he says, Behold, I see the heavens open." And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And I don't know all the significance that could, that could have. That there's the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. But see, uh, a lot of places it says that after he, was, after he suffered, he was exalted. And he's sitting down at God's right hand. Here he's standing. You will say, well, that's his high priestly ministry. But uh, see, that I think the first application is there is he's welcoming Stephen home. He's saying to Stephen... Welcome home. And I'm sure uh, he's going to say the same, uh, said the same, you know, Lazarus was grand entrance. And every one of us, if we're in Christ, we're going to have that grand entrance. But we're going to be carried into God's presence. And our Savior is not going to be sitting down waiting for us. He's going to be greeting us. Uh, God himself is going to receive us, and so we'll be with him. So there's that grand entrance. But for the rich man, it just says he died and was buried. Now, as I thought of this, did Lazarus even get a funeral? You know, the pauper's, the pauper's burial. I'm sure they buried him. Sanitation, right? So they buried Lazarus' body. And it says here that, <clears throat> that the rich man died and he was buried, but I would also expect he had a pretty good funeral, right? There were speeches made about him. Uh, there was an abundance of flowers and fine linen and purple. If the casket was open, I'm sure he was dressed uh, uh, pretty good, right? And a lot of fine things were said about him. <clears throat> but see, all the Bible says is he was died and was buried. And the very next verse tells us, it says, and in hell. And so, <clears throat> you know, the grand funeral, it's good to honor the dead, right? 
respect the body. That's proper. I don't think it's proper to disrespect uh, the dead body nor to, uh, to cremate it. Uh, yes, uh, we can't stop the resurrection, but I think it's a sign of, of, of unbelief and uh, certainly a, a sign of, of I, I think it's a sin to, to cremate. Um, I think it's, it's much better. Uh, <clears throat> see, we should try to respect the body and preserve it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> here we said, it just says, with, a with uh, Lazarus, he died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. But it says also, oh, yeah, the rich man died also, and he was buried. And so there's a great difference in their life. There was a great difference in their death. <clears throat> but here we see also there's a great contrast, a great difference in their eternal state. It says, speaking of, again, it goes back to the rich man first. It says, and in hell... He lifted up his eyes being in torments. So we see where he is. He's in hell, Hades, and he's in torment. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time here, but it's a place of torments. He says in verse uh, <clears throat> 24, For I am tormented in this flame. In verse 25, uh, Abraham said to him, In your life you had good things, but he says, Now you're tormented. And... Uh, then also, verse 28, he says, Somebody to my brethren, so they won't come to this place of torment. Four times in this brief portion of Scripture, the Lord Jesus says it's a place of torment. <clears throat> and those, you know, we, I'm not sure the name, the Lord standard free holder, I don't know, but he says that we need a new gospel, we need you know, the, old, the old way of teaching God's word. You know, look, first of all, let's get rid of this idea of original sin in some place called hell. Well, the Lord would differ with him greatly, wouldn't he? And uh, that fool will wake up someday in torments unless God shows him great mercy as he did us. And so uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, uh, rich man, it says, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. What a difference between him and Lazarus because it says at Lazarus, he says he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. What's he doing there? He's resting. He's being comforted. Again, we see that word in verse 25. Uh, Abraham says, uh, Lazarus is now comforted. We think of the words as we read Revelation 20 and 20. There'll be no more sorrow. Comfort. We're going to have comfort. Uh, we're going to have relief. And uh, see, what was uh, this rich man looking for in hell? He says he was looking for just a little relief. But see, he has no relief. And uh, I was thinking, he showed no mercy to Lazarus, and now he's not receiving any mercy, right? And, uh, just a, 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 a thought here. Uh, we're going to what? Uh, as we judge others, if, we don't, if we're not merciful, how can we expect mercy? Or how about the other way around? If God's been merciful to us, we will show mercy to others. We should be merciful. And it should be something that we should be working on uh, constantly how we can show mercy to others. <clears throat> and so, he's in torment, and he's looking, he says he cried and said, Abraham, have mercy. So we see this great contrast between him and Lazarus uh, in their, where they end up after they're dead. <coughs> Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. Uh, this rich man is in hell, lifting up his eyes, being in torment. And uh, I thought of, you know, again, that Lord, as the Lord spoke to the thief on the cross, he says, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, Paul says to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. And so that is our hope. Uh, and for those who are lost, they're going to be like this rich man. They're going to wake up uh, and, and they're going to be in hell. They're going to be in a place of torment and there'll be no relief. <clears throat> As we think of contrast, we think of the contrast between this life and the next. You see, look at all the suffering that Lazarus went through. But think of all the comfort he's having now. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that it's not worthy to be compared. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, I believe. Uh, it's not worthy uh, to compare our present suffering with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Paul says it's not even worthy making the comparison. <clears throat> and so, 
whether we're in the state that Lazarus are in, or whether we're in a much better state, <clears throat> we can't compare what we're going through to what we're going to receive, the blessings we're going to receive uh, when, we, uh, when we get to, uh, to be in God's presence for eternity. And so there's that great comparison there. Uh, and so Abraham says in verse 25, he said, in your lifetime you receive good things. And Lazarus evil, but now he says it's been reversed. Lazarus is comforted, and you are tormented. Now that word good things and evil things uh, was not really a moral thing. It's the idea of, of something nice and something not nice. So, you know, it wasn't sinful to be rich, but it was good. And the, and, and the, and the way that we look at, use that word good, it wasn't sinful to be poor, but it was evil or, or in the sense that it was a nice thing. Who, who would want to be covered in swords? Not me. I don't want to eat off the floor. Uh, but <clears throat> it's not a sinful thing, but it is a, it is a bad thing. And so uh, we have that same word evil used in Ecclesiastes uh, when it says that, uh, <clears throat> uh, that we should uh, remember the creator of the days of our youth before the evil day comes. That is, when we, before we get old and we can't enjoy our food and we can't enjoy this and we can't enjoy that. Uh, <clears throat> and just talking about the ill, that is the discomfort that comes with aging, and uh, but also uh, we can have much joy on the inside with aging. Some of the happiest Christians are the older Christians, even those who are in great pain and discomfort. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> uh, we have such a great difference in where they end up. <clears throat> and we see here that uh, this rich man is looking for mercy, and notice he doesn't get a drop of water. Nor does he get any request. He says, if I can't have that drop of water, he says, then send somebody to my five brethren. And Abraham says, no, that's not going to happen either. Uh, there is no pleading with God in hell, is there? And, and I honestly don't think there's going to be anybody like, uh, like uh, uh, this rich man. Otherwise, in hell, they're not going to be turning to God. They're going to be <coughs> they're going to be in torment. They're not going to be repenting. <clears throat> uh, they may wish for relief as this rich man did. Uh, but they're not looking for mercy. That is, they're not looking for salvation. And they will not be repentant. If you read other scriptures, it says, uh, they gnashed their teeth and cursed God. Not that they gnashed their teeth and cried out for mercy. But we see here, there's no relief for his torment. Uh, <clears throat> there's no drop of water for his tongue. And there's no drop, there's no, uh, there's no uh, messenger to be sent back to his brethren. Now, it's interesting where does he want the relief to come from? Lazarus. He says, send Lazarus to bring me a drop of water. Send Lazarus back to my brother. Uh, you know, what did he ever do for Lazarus? You see, God says, you will sow what you reap. You didn't give Lazarus mercy, but see, Abraham says also, if you think of this contrast, what a great gulf there's fixed. Abraham says, there's a great gulf fixed between us and you. There's no crossing over. Those who would go and seek repentance and salvation and to go into God's presence, <clears throat> uh, it's, once they're dead, there is no salvation. Uh, hell is eternal. That's the second death. Uh, there's no salvation. There's no mercy on the other side of the grave. And also I think of those who would, you know, there's no anybody crossing down to hell to show mercy. Uh, what does the Lord call hell? He says a place of outer darkness. See, God's goodness is not in hell. <clears throat> there's no blessing there. There's no relief. There's no messenger. There's no drop of water. And there's no hope. Hell is a place of torment. And I think, uh, be, besides the physical pain, I, I just think the, the torment of being totally outside of God's goodness, it would be overwhelming. See, the sinner today, no matter how sinful and how evil he is, he benefited from God's goodness in this world. He may not appreciate it, he may not understand it. He may not think of it much. Uh, but there, the good that's in this world is the good that comes from God and through God's people and through God's spirit in this world. When that good, when that presence, when God's influence is gone, you see the Lord Jesus says, depart from me. I have nothing to do with you. And uh, hell is such a terrible place to be. A place of torment physically, but also uh, a place of no blessing whatsoever. And I don't think we understand just how evil that would be uh, to be out of God's presence for eternity. And so, 
what a great contrast, what a great gulf. And we think, well, there's also that great gulf between the living and the dead. But see, <clears throat> uh, there have been those who would come back from the dead, haven't there? There's been others that have been raised from the dead. Our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. He said if they would send somebody from the dead to cross that gulf. But as we close here, I would just like to look at the sufficiency of the word of God. <clears throat> See, this rich man says, if I can't have that drop of water, he says, I have five brethren. And I want somebody to witness to them. Uh, somebody new, God to do a new thing. And uh, Abraham says they have the word of God. They have Moses and the prophets. And he said, That's, no, 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 no. Uh, they're used to that. We need something better. We need something exciting. We need a miracle. We need somebody to come back from the dead. If somebody came back from the dead, then they would believe. That's what he says, isn't it? <clears throat> he says, Nay, Father Abraham, it says, If one came back from the dead, they will repent. Well, see, that's a lie. <clears throat> you see, what saves people today? Do we need to see the Lord Jesus physically? You see, the Lord did come back from the, from the grave, didn't he? He says, By many infallible proofs. But see, there's more people saved through the preaching of the resurrection than there is by the eyewitness of the resurrection. Way more people say through the word of God. It's the word of God. Now, <clears throat> we think of, they said, show us a sign. The Lord says, you don't need a sign. You got the, the only sign you've got is the word of God. You have the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly. You don't need to see me physically. You don't need to be like Thomas. You don't need to touch. You just need to believe the word of God. And that's what saves. That's what brings life. And that, you see, there's another great contrast here. There's those that are, uh, have life, and there's those, those that dwell in darkness. So you may be alive, but you might be dead. You might be separated from God. You might be, <clears throat> and unless God saves you, <clears throat> then there's a great difference between the saved and the lost, isn't there? Even on this side of the grave, <clears throat> there's a great gulf. But see, the Lord Jesus has bridged that gulf, but it's through the preaching of the Word of God. And as I... Just think of this. I just want to look at a couple more verses. <clears throat> uh, Psalm 37, 9 to 10. Now, I skipped this, but I, I'm just thinking of the death and, and uh, of, uh, of this rich man. <clears throat> you see, Lazarus died and was carried into Abraham's bosom. But this rich man, uh, <clears throat> it just says he was buried. He died and he was buried. Turn to Psalm 37, verses 9 and 10. It says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but they that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, see, Lazarus is going to inherit the earth. You say, look, look at the place of this rich man. Look at the beauty of it. Look at his situation, his circumstances, his blessing." And we have to be very careful that we're not covetous, right? You say, well, I'm not covetous. Well, if we're discontent, we're covetous. You say, well, I wish I had. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I had a nicer house. I wish I had a bit better car. I wish I had a nicer car. I wish, I wish, I wish. You say, well, I don't, you know. You say, well, even a thought. Well, it's a wrong thought. We shouldn't think that way. How easy it is to fall in that trap. And we've got so much in this world to entice us. And say, you deserve this. You know, five easy payments, 500 easy payments, whatever they say. But you deserve it. You deserve, you deserve, you want, you want, you want. Enticing us to what? To be discontent. And uh, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with having these things. But be careful. What it says here, it says here that we should what? Diligently consider his place. We need to consider this rich man <clears throat> and consider what we want. And also consider how good our position is and what our duty is to others. <clears throat> but also as we look at this, uh, as the sufficiency of God's word, I just want to close here. We'll look at uh, <clears throat> 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And uh, we'll see what Peter has to say about, uh, see, Peter was an eyewitness. He saw the Lord risen, didn't he? Remember, he says, you know, they saw, and he says, it's the Lord. And he, was running, you know, how happy he was to see the risen Lord. But here's Peter's testimony in 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> uh, 
and we'll read verses 15 to, uh, to 19. Uh, Peter says, I'm going to die soon. He says, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fable, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came a voice to him from this excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. You say, what a thing to be there at the Mount of Transfiguration and see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, we've got something better than Peter had. We've got the completed word of God. And so Peter says in verse 19, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. See, if you're uh, here in that dark place, <clears throat> you need the word of God. You see, there were many that... Uh, you know, the Lord Jesus physically arose, and he didn't show himself to everybody, I realize that, but see, you see, the real work of God, the church really grew when the Lord went back, and the, 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 the apostles began through the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the word of God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Let's take one more look at a verse from Peter, and that's back in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, verse 23, he says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God has magnified his word. <clears throat> and you say, well, if there was no resurrection, yes, but it's the preaching of the resurrection through the word of God, not through signs and wonders, not through a visible manifestation of the Lord Jesus physically on earth. <clears throat> we see Christ in the scriptures. And so Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Abraham said to this rich man, they've had Moses and the prophets. He says if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, then there's no hope for them. And that's what we need to preach. That's the riches. You think of we have the riches of the word of God <clears throat> and how we need to share it to those in need. But also if you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> you need to hear the word of God. If you don't hear the word of God, if you don't receive it by faith, <clears throat> If you don't trust it, if your hope is not built on God's word, then there's there, nothing else is going to do. There is no other solution. There is no other life. <clears throat> it's how we're saved, but it's also how we live by the word of God. And so we see here, as the Lord gives us this uh, <clears throat> great uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus, and I believe they're real people, uh, uh, that we have these contrasts to consider. Uh, we have, you know, the great... Uh, Reversal, whatever we're going through, is not to be compared to where we're going to end up. That grand entrance, our death of the saint is precious. <clears throat> but also we think of eternity with the Lord. But also we think of how sufficient the scriptures is. We don't need anything else but God's word. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that word this evening. We thank you for the words of life, Father. I pray that you might use this portion of scripture to speak to our hearts, to encourage us. Uh, Father, if there are those in our past who are uh, in need this evening or need this week, Father, that we might uh, open up our heart of compassion and that we might give them those things that they need, that we might be able to minister to them. Uh, Father, I pray most of all that you might bring the lost into thy kingdom. So we ask this in Jesus' name.